I'm Charlotte Relier. Uh, as Tara said, I um, lead our women's initiative at McKinsey, and this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I assume a pretty timely and uh, topic right now for all of you. Um, I'm going to share some of our, the insights from our women in the workplace research that we do uh, together with Lean In. We're in our second year of doing a survey of approximately about 130 companies have participated, about 34,000 um, participants, and those companies represent about f almost five or four and a half thousand. Four, four and a half million employees. Uh, so a lot of great insights that we've been able to get out of the data. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a topic that's really near and dear to my heart. So as in addition to spending a lot of time on women's issues at McKinsey, I'm a mother of, I have a daughter, and you know I'm, I'm always thinking about, hey, you know, how is this world going to be different when she is in the workplace, and how can we make that happen together? So before I get into the research, I wanted to lay a little bit of the groundwork for why this is a topic that people should care about. Um, other than a lot of the obvious reasons, the economic case is real. So we did research in our par parity research uh, where we looked at different regions across the globe and estimated what the impact would be if women achieved parity. Um, and that's impact is about 28 trillion if we close the gap. Uh, you know, recognizing that's slightly unreasonable. Uh, we also said, well, what if each company within its region, were, sorry, each country within its region were able to reach parity at the, of, or the pace of change of the fastest changing countries in the region? And that's how it has an impact of about 12 trillion. So this is a huge number, obviously, and something that we all need to care about. In the US, this impact is about 2.1 trillion. So this is bigger than the GDP of Texas. Um, and there's three main gaps uh, that, to close in order to get parity. One is participation. So in the US, it's about 40% of the gap is participation, 30% from moving people from part-time to full-time, and then 30% productivity. And that's, that's essentially people in lower wage or lower productive jobs or sectors um, and with pay gaps. So if those things close, we would see um, 2.1 trillion. So at the company level, what's the case for change? We typically look at it in four lenses. So one is the more obvious, most obvious one, or values, right? A second one is around talent. Third is performance. It, there's actual link to performance and gender diversity. And finally, the customer. How do we actually relate more to our customer base that's making decisions? Primarily, there are a lot of women making the, the decisions in the household. So first, if you think about values, um, women make up a huge portion of the the, the workplace, right? Um, but if you look at their uh, pay gap, women are making about 80 or 20% less than men. And furthermore, there's actually a differential in what happens when the, the perform there's positive versus negative performance. So in, positive, in times of positive performance, women tend to get less of a bump um, and, and share in less of the upside and actually get penalized more when there's negative performance. So the meritocracy, while it's important and it's something that we all talk about, it's not there yet. Talent. So winning the war for talent, needless to say, means getting more women. Today, college graduates, women that are college graduates, represent 58% um, of, the, of the college graduate population. And so if you want to get talent, you need to get talent women, both right out of college, but also at every stage in the pipeline. Performance. There have been many studies, and I know you've done a lot of study, studies at, at Google on the power of diverse teams and diversity of thought. The research that we've done shows that gender diverse companies outperform by 15% and eth ethnically diverse companies outperform by 35%. So there's a real case for, for performance of, in, in diversity. Uh, and finally, the customer. So women are making a lot of the decisions at the household. This is obviously in the B2C world. Um, but if you think about that, actually having a diverse organization that's serving those households is quite important. So now let's turn to the women in the workplace uh, research. For starters, um, the, uh, we've been benchmarking this for about 10 years. We've been benchmarking and studying women in the workplace, the pipeline, the data for, over, for about 10 years. Over the past few years, we've also started expanding to, to also benchmark and look at the experiences and attitudes of men and women as well, so we'll get into that. Um, but when you look at the trends, the data trends of the pipeline, 
it's going to take, given how the, the glacial pace at which we're moving, it's going to take about 100 years to reach gender parity in the C-suite, 100 years. So I'm personally hoping that we can speed that up a little bit because I'd like my daughter <laughs> to be able to have a better chance and not have to wait till my great granddaughter uh, to see parity. So what does the corporate pipeline look like? And this is US data, by the way, but when we look at the European data, it's relatively similar. The corporate pipeline is not looking great. So our results from this year reaffirm what we keep seeing over the past, what we've seen over the past 10 years, which is women are represented at every level in the pipeline, in the organization, and the numbers aren't changing much year after year. We're gonna come back to this one, but despite a misperception, this is not due to attrition, right? This is actually due to promotion and, some, and other factors, so we'll come back to that. If you look at women of color, it's even worse, right? It's even more stark. So at the C-suite, instead of 17%, you see 3%, for example. And if you look at some of the Wall Street Journal research on the ambition of um, women of color, black, Hispanic, and Asian women, are 48% of them said they aspire to be a top executive compared with 37% of white women. So there's not a lack of ambition on the part of, of women of color. So now going back to, to attrition, it is not the driving factor. And this is a very common misperception. And clearly, this is a, a myth-busting <laughs> piece of data. But if you look at this is attrition by tenure. And men actually attrite faster than women, which means it's not that women are leaving, right? And often, look, the, the one caveat to this is this doesn't necessarily say where the men are going. So they might actually be going into another uh, uh, position similar to another organization. But still, um, <clears throat> if you look at this, it's not saying that the reason why we're, not, we're, we're losing women at more senior levels is because they're leaving. So let's talk about the challenge. The challenge starts early at the very first milestone. For every 100 women promoted, about 130 men are promoted at the first promotion. So this is from the entry level position to manager, for example. And then we also see discrepancy in hiring throughout the pipeline. So what that means is it just keeps getting worse. So not only are we promoting men at a faster rate at the earlier stages, but then we're also bringing in more men throughout the, the funnel. Uh, and furthermore, we're promoting women at a slower rate. So all of these things are contributing to the state of the pipeline. So now let's turn for a moment to the second part of what I had originally mentioned, which is not just the pipeline data, but the experience data. So what are the attitudes of men and women in the workplace, and how does that explain some of the data? So I'm going to start by getting a little bit of involvement from you in the room. So first question, raise your hand if yes. Has your gender been a disadvantage as you've climbed the corporate ladder? Yes, it has. Raise your hand if it's yes. Okay. First of all, it's great that a lot of you have not had that issue, but I do see, if I look around the room, probably more women raising their hands, uh, which is consistent with the data. So if you look at the data, women perceive more disadvantages based on their gender, and the gap keeps getting wider as you go more senior. And when we look at the actual um, qualitative data behind the survey, women consistently report feeling that their comp contributions are often valued less than men, um, that they're being turned to less than men for important decisions, uh, that they're participating less meaningfully in meetings, and often they're re receiving fewer challenging assignments than men. Other research that we've done often shows that men get stretch assignments and are, are promoted based on potential, whereas often women are promoted based on performance and the history of their performance. And one other factoid um, on millennials, which is you'd hope that this is changing for millennials, but actually millennials have answered these questions in very similar ways um, to the rest of the workforce. So another question, raise your hand if yes. Do you have meaningful access to senior leadership? Yes. Okay, all right, better, better. Uh, so men and women also report having different access to senior leaders and networks. So this is also another case where the gap grows and particularly at more senior levels where access to senior leadership is especially important for sponsorship and for promotion, it gets worse. And one of the reasons behind this also has to do with networks. So women tend to have networks, this our research shows, that are 50-50 women-men, and then men tend to have networks that are primarily male. So if you then think about within my network, just if you do the math, 
it has to be true, right, that women just have smaller networks if that's the case, because we know that there's so many more men in senior ranks, or they have smaller networks of senior leaders. And so what does that mean? Obviously, we need to get more women in senior positions, but we also need to uh, make sure that men are mentoring women. That's a big, big gap, and we'll come back to that one. But often, people tend to mentor others that are very similar to themselves. Um, they don't feel as comfortable. Men might not feel comfortable taking a woman out to drinks if that's the way the mentorship relationship begins and things like that. So how do you actually start becoming very, and this is a call to action for the men in the room, how can you get really purposeful about thinking about who you want to mentor and sponsor within your organization, which women you're going to really take under your wing? Because that makes a huge difference. So how about this? Do you, do you feel that you've received as much feedback as your peers? Raise your hand if yes. OK, a little bit of a mix, a little bit of a mix. Um, so our research shows that women receive less feedback than men. Um, mess, and, and more specifically, the, the tough developmental messages. OK, so, so what does that mean? Especially as you get more senior, hearing the tough messages that help you develop is extremely important to developing and progressing. And not only women, men, but women actually have a, hard, have a harder time giving the, giving the hard, telling the hard messages to other women. So both men and women worry that they're going to create an emotional response or um, that they are going to be perceived as mean or hurtful. I mean, this goes back to a lot with unconscious bias, but by giving a woman feedback. And if you think about that, I mean, that's doing a tremendous disservice, tremendous disservice, because we know that people grow through developmental feedback. And so how can we all ask ourselves, are we doing that, right? Are you giving the hard but important messages to women in the same way that you're giving to men? And if you're not, how might you shift your mindset to say, you know, this is, my intention is to help this person grow, and so being mean or hurtful is not the issue. It's about using the intention, of a positive intent. So have you ever been called aggressive, intimidating, demanding, or bossy? Oh, okay. This is a great culture. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm, I'm raising my hand, too, by the way. Um, so. The good news, so this is, we, we looked at this from the following angle. We said, how many people are more likely to negotiate, whether it's for higher pay or um, a promotion or something else, are you willing to negotiate? And the good news is that women are negotiating at the same rate as men, so we're, we're doing it. But the bad news is that um, women get un unduly penalized right, for being bossy and aggressive. So what that means is that um, when, <clears throat> What that means is that uh, the percentage of women and men that were um, called bossy, aggressive, or intimidating is much higher for those that for the women that negotiated versus the men. And and by the way, 19% of the women who didn't even say they negotiated feel like they're being called those things uh, a lot of the time. So how do we change the game? Let's talk about changing the game. Three things we've seen in companies that are the best. And so first of all, I'm going to start by saying this is a, <clears throat> we are, as, as we saw in the data, we are far from where we need to be. Um, and no one company has cracked the code. So there's nobody that's figured it out and d doing it tremendously well. Lots of companies are trying different things and having success with, in different ways. But nobody is, has cracked the code. But we looked at some of the companies that had over 30% women in the C-suite, right? So those that were doing the best on this dimension. And we said, what are, three, what are some of the things that are common? So three things, and we'll dive into them in a minute. So one is um, persistence. Many of these companies, including McKinsey, has been at this for, for 10 years or more, right? We've been talking about it. We've been looking at the data. We've been trying different things. And you know, it takes time. It takes time and commitment. The second one is the CEO commitment. So this is not a social, you know, nice to have thing on the side. This is a true priority from the CEO. And this is commitment that cascades all the way down the organization in the way that any business initiative would. That's number two. And then number three is holistic change programs. So the, again, it's not about a bunch of policies or programs on the side, but it's the holistic change programs that engage people throughout the organization, that include all the metrics and the data and monitoring, the way you'd run any major holistic change transformation. All of those elements are true. 
So let's dive into that last one for a moment. The first part of that is really making a compelling ca change ca for case for diversity. It's not just about saying it. So if you look at this, right, almost 80% of companies claim that gender diversity is a priority. But the, but the employees don't really buy it. So this is the percentage of people in different level, the percentage of people that say my manager, sales leaders, or my senior leaders, or my CEO consider this a priority. They don't they don't buy that companies are actually making it a priority. And why is that? <clears throat> well, we looked at some of these organizations and a lot, and even companies that look great on paper. They've got amazing policies. They've got work from home. They've got flexible work style. They've got parental leave. They have lots of you know community uh, events and efforts. Um, but if they're not walking the walk, if it doesn't, if it's not clear to the organization that it's actually okay to take advantage of those programs and that it's championed that you're a part of those things, people don't do them. They might exist, people don't do them. They think, you know, going on a longer maternity leave is a, you know, kiss of death. It's my walk down the, you know, path of the, 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 um, the downward cycle. So, so companies also therefore need to be talking about it, right? There's lots of companies that are talking about it. I think you're probably, t <laughs> you're, you are all talking about it a lot right now and we can continue to talk about it. But how do you, the CEOs need to be very clear that this is a priority, that there's a business case behind it, that we're making it happen. And so here's just a couple of examples um, of organizations like P&G and JP Morgan that are really putting muscle behind making this a priority for the organization and talking about it a lot. So secondly, this is about policy, right, and procedure, the way in which you do hiring, reviews, promotions, um, making sure that there's real equity there. There's real gender discrepancies in how people perceive fairness at work. So people really feel that, that it is not quite as fair as the companies say it is, right? That, um, and particularly women uh, feel that you know, promotions and, um, and getting opportunities, they are at a disadvantage. I, I, we've talked about that before within the data. Um, but how do you actually change that? So there are a few things, right? If you look at just how do you do it in the different stages of talent management, so hiring, reviews, and promotions. A big thing, uh, particularly within hiring, but also within reviews and promotions, is unconscious bias. Um, so how do you th really figure out ways to remove unconscious bias? So there's organizations um, that have that, that are doing blind resume screening, that are bringing in you know new games and ways of applying to the to, to the um, to the organization that don't. Um, that don't require you know seeing somebody face to face, but it's rather looking at their work or looking at or listening to their music or what have you before there's a face to face interaction. So there's absolutely no bias. And those organizations that have done that type of blind screening actually find much more parity in their hiring practices. Um, you know, VMware, for example, this is in the in 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 the. Um, uh, reviews, they actually train managers right before they write a review to, um, to, to, to remove unconscious bias. So they remind people about gender biases, they remind people about potentially loaded phrases like women you know, needing to have more presence things like that, um, and, uh, and, and they, write it, they have a memo, and every manager is required to read it right before they write their performance reviews. So putting it top of mind in people right at the moment of, of writing a review. Um, similarly, on promotions, um, often there is a, you know, some organizations are requiring that slates for promotions always have a certain percentage of women on them. That's not to say that the women are getting promoted. It's not a quota. It's not a quota for promotion. It's not meant to steer the actual promotion itself. It's just meant to say often what happens is the slate doesn't have enough women on it, and so it ends up going to a man. So if you actually just make sure the slate has it, that ends up having impact. And again, keep, keeping in mind that the promotion itself is based on, on meritocracy, but that it's just the slate that, that has been sort of forced to, to really make sure that people are removing their bias and putting, putting different, different um, profiles on it. So the third is um, accountability. Um, and results, so focusing on accountability and results. And um, we've talked about this uh, you know, a bit and the idea that um, if you don't measure it, it doesn't happen, right? 
Like if you can't see it, if you don't measure it, if you don't call it out, if people are not accountable to these um, metrics, then it's not going to do anything, right? And so if you look at this, I mean, 40% of companies are saying they hold their uh, leaders accountable for performance against gender diversity. Going back to 80% of the companies say it's a priority, but only 40% are holding leaders accountable. Um, and a very small percentage of employees agree that the progress is actually being measured and gender diversity is being measured. So some of the things that we're seeing here are how can you literally just, um, how are different organizations publicizing their pipeline, their funnel, um, how, how different managers are doing. Um, oftentimes, managers don't even realize what they're doing, so by actually giving them the data, um, this is how many people you interviewed last, last year, and this is the percentage of them that were women, and this is your promotion rate of women, and this is the way in which you've been, you know, if you go through and look at all your performance reviews, these are the types of comments that you have on women versus men. Really starting to bring to light what's happening is a way to create a lot of, a, a lot of visibility and opportunity. You know, for example, IKEA set has made achieving a 50-50 gender split one of the key metrics that managers are evaluated on. Salesforce publishes diversity numbers, as we all know, right? In 2015, Mark Benioff said that he had the goal to employ an equal number of women and men and thinks that this is absolutely doable and is on the, on the path to doing that. So how do you start to set those goals and measure them? Empowering employees to lead the change. So one of the things that we've also found is paired with the whole um, numbers game and really making sure that you're getting diverse numbers and you're tracking them, et cetera, is inclusion. So how do you, how do you get more inclusion? And that's something that has been, I know, near, probably a very big part of how you all operate, right, with the focus on diverse teams and diversity of thought. That's, a, that's, that's exactly what we're talking about. How do you actually create an a, um, environment that feels inclusive for um, individuals of all different types of backgrounds? And that's a way to help create inclusivity for women. Um, and that's about culture. And culture change happens all the way down the organization with every last person. And engaging change agents and engaging people in different pockets of the organization to really drive this cultural change. So lastly, of course, educating people, right? Right now, most most employees don't know how to promote gender diversity, right? There's a lot of people that say we want to do it, but there's not a lot of people that know how to do it. And whether that's telling your middle managers that, hey, if you just literally choose, if every man in the middle management chose to mentor or sponsor one or two more women, how much impact that could have. Um, if senior leaders chose to sponsor another, another woman, if senior leaders chose to speak out and make this a priority, and really cascade this down the organization, the way in which that can move the needle. And even at the entry level, it's how can you really promote inclusive practices from day one? So it doesn't feel like a frat or you know, a certain type of environment that is not welcoming to women or other types of, um, or, or, or other diverse backgrounds. And then role modeling. And this is part of it as well. So actually, calling it out. I mean, this is how women and men answered whether or not pe managers are calling out gender biased language or behavior. It is not okay if you hear someone say something that's offensive. You just call it out. I mean, imagine if everybody called that out, it just wasn't tolerated. That makes a huge difference, right? Embracing different leadership styles. I think that this is better than calling out, you know, styles that are, are or, or activities that are language that is negative, but being able to embrace, there's lots of different styles and there's lots of different ways to be successful here. And we're gonna role model those different ways and, and, and celebrate different profiles. So building this generation of diversity champions, training them, celebrating them, modeling that, modeling it, right? Let's, how, you know, how can you celebrate people that are diversity champions? We, you know, even at McKinsey, we're starting to do that, right? How do we celebrate people that are doing, making a real difference? And that's a huge um, honor to those people. And things like that really start to get people excited and motivated. Training them, as we, we talked about before, but what do they need to know? How do they need to behave differently? How can they make a difference? And making sure that you're modeling and role modeling what you want to see. So what can you do today? These are a few things. I'd love to actually even open it up and hear from you what you all think you can do. Um, but some of the things, just to start the conversation around, 
<clears throat> talking about why gender diversity matters to you, both up and down. Um, calling out the biases, as we mentioned, not tolerating any behavior that is, but is, demonstrates bias. Um, creating scorecards and measuring and monitoring, changing your language, just reminding yourself to use, that, that, remind yourself to think about it. Sometimes it's just as simple as that. Committing to sponsor women um, and sharing in success stories of women, celebrating women that have done amazing things. So what are some of the, what, are, what are some other things? And by the way, I'm also open to take questions, but I figured I'd start with a question to you, um, which is what are some of the things that you're doing about it or that you're, you think Google should be doing about it? Um, well, my manager, who's sitting uh, two, man two rows behind me and with my team, uh, uh, made the suggestion that we use a reg regularly scheduled uh, kind of tech talk session where we uh, uh, you know, watch YouTube videos about uh, technical things or non-technical things uh, as a group and discuss them and come here instead. And I think that's a great, uh, you know, great way to uh, improve gender diversity and, and uh, get us talking about it more. Uh, admittedly, we've been talking about it a lot in the last week, but um, this is, uh, you know, it, it, it's a great way for a manager to have an impact on their team and, and uh, spread that knowledge. Thank you. Nice job. So first of all, thanks for coming today and presenting this to us. The research and metric driven approach really hits it home for me. Um, I love data and this really is, it, it really calls it out very clearly, um, focusing on that data, but also tying in people's perceptions. Um, question for you. You mentioned call out bias when you see it, it only takes one voice. So I've had experiences where someone will say something and it takes me like a few seconds to like process what they've actually said. And then I'm like, wait, what? And then I'm like, should I say something now? Like five seconds I've already got, now it's 10 seconds. <laughs> and it's like, so I'm, I'm wondering if you have any like tips for calling that out because it sometimes does take a little bit of time for me to process. And then I'm like, 20 seconds has gone by. What do I do? <laughs> kind of a thing. Or if anyone else has any tips as well, I'd, I'd love to hear them, so. I, I'm happy to answer that. I feel like it's never too late. Just say it. You could say, hey, you know, it took me a minute because I was, I felt like that was really inappropriate what you said, and I just want you to know. And you could also go at it with the intent. I mean, I think another thing is always about intent. So always assume positive intent from the other person, and then you could have a much greater impact in the, in, in the, in the feedback that you're giving. So hey, I know you, you might not have meant it to come across it this way, but let me tell you how it made me feel. And hey, you might want to, you know, consider not doing that next time. Awesome, thank you. So I'm a father, I have four kids, and uh, one of them is a girl, and she runs the, runs the house. But um, <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of the, or I, I believe that a lot of these things are a lot deeper than the workplace. They're foundational in the way that we raise our kids and they promote values and unintentionally buy pink things for my daughter and blue things for my sons. And like, wh what things can we do as parents and as, you know, in a, in a sort of a grassroots sense and as communities as we're raising our kids, you know, to help with this. I mean, that, I, don't even get me started. We, uh, <laughs> um, I think there's a tremendous amount we can do as we're raising our kids. I mean, I, I can tell you just personally what I do. Um, so I have a daughter and a son, <clears throat> and as much as, I mean, I try to congratulate them for the same types of things. So a lot of times parents will tell the girl they're really pretty and they don't even mean it. Or other people in, the, in, you know, in their environment will tell the girl they're really pretty and the guy, he did really well on that problem, right? And so I try to congratulate my daughter for problem solving and tell my son he looks really cute. <laughs> <laughs> But no, no, seriously, and, 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 and just really thinking about the language that you're using, because that's where it's, that is where it starts. Like when you get, what, what are you getting praise for? How are people demonstrating love? Are you, you know, telling your daughter that she's being too bossy, like too early on? Um, if there's an, if, if you see two children playing, because even if, no matter what you do in your household, you're not gonna be able to change what's happening in other people's households. But talking about it, right, and even in recognizing, like, hey, so and so said this, but in our family, this is what we believe, and this is how 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 we conduct ourselves. So I don't know. You probably all have lots of ideas as well. If anyone else wants to share, the question was, 
given we know that lots of executive um, promotions are higher, actually come ex are external hires versus just internal promotions, how do executive search firms and other players that might be helping find the um, slate of candidates for senior positions contribute to or detract from the goal at hand, which is to increase the number of women in these senior executive positions? I'll tell you, so we haven't specifically looked at biases, for example, in executive recruiting practices. What, um, and, and actually I think um, in general, most people when they're talking to executive recruiters are pretty specific, say they wanna see women candidates. It's actually, cause it's a priority for a lot of senior leaders. Um, I, I will say though, in the end, what it does happen is that more men are hired in at, um, at senior levels and, and, and laterally than women. So in addition to different promotion, um, <clears throat> Women getting promoted less frequently, men are coming. More men are coming in at more senior levels, um, and so for that, um, you know, we have an action. Like, so, I, so I can I can hypothesize. Um, I don't want to speak for the data because I don't. We don't actually have the data underlying that. But my sense is that is driven in large part by a lot of the same biases that might take place in the. Um, recruiting and selection process uh, for any role, right? That um, you know the way in which the res the, the way in which the uh, job spec is written is often much more tailored to a man and a man's background. Often in the selection process, there's a bias um, towards men. Uh, people tend to look at men and see, pe you know, pr as I mentioned before, see <clears throat> a potential, whereas women, they look for performance. And so the bar tends to be higher for women. There's a lot of biases that take place in, in that process. And I think that's, that, that, that's probably where it's coming from. I'm not sure it's purely, you know, based on what's happening at the executive recruiting side of things. Hi. Uh, thanks for sharing all this with us. It's uh, really just great to see like practical applications of things. Um, so I have one thing to share that I feel like has been super personally helpful for me on the changing your own language bit of things. Um, so a lot of us participate a ton in both hiring, so writing you know reviews for people who are coming in as candidates and also in the sort of performance review process when you write peer reviews for all the people who are going up for promotion or just generating feedback. Um, and taking out gender pronouns entirely from feedback that you write I feel like has both a big impact on the way that I write, but also for people who are gonna just be reading feedback, right? This is going to committee, it's going to hiring committee or performance review committee for promotions. Um, not having gender pronouns, like it does change the way that you have to write and the way that you use adjectives and the way that people will interpret what you're writing. Um, and it's made a big difference for me and just my personal like capabilities of writing, I think, useful feedback about people. So I'd say for people who are doing that you know, on their own, or if you are working with other people, even out of your emails, when you're writing about what someone else had said, or recap from a meeting, like trying not to rely on those actually pushes you a little bit further in like giving useful descriptions of someone or their projects or what has happened in a given scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that's like great. a really small change that you can make. Yeah, so. I mean, th and that's very aligned to a lot of the resume screen, uh, blind resume screening tests that have been done, where literally, there have been tests that have shown the minute that any understanding of what the gender is of the applicant is taken away, that all of a sudden the hiring becomes goes to parity. It's amazing, right? So exactly, like the, if you can take that away, how much of a difference that can make? So I'm a white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant, male, identifies straight, a manager, so on and so forth. So like the bingo of being <laughs> part of the privileged class, so to speak. Um, so I'm wondering from your research, looking at many different companies, like how do you go straight at that majority to affect change at scale? How do you, sorry, what? How do you, how have you seen or how do you go at people like me at scale in organizations to make them part of the change and not rely on the underrepresented groups to stand up to make that change? Well, it's literally engaging you in part of the process. Right, it's engaging you in being a champion of change, in signing up to mentor or sponsor a set of women, in driving specific initiatives within the organization. In fact, it's really important, and we've found that it's really important, that men lead a lot of these initiatives, that is not all women-led. So I think the, the real important thing is to get people like you to actually own and, and, do, and, and lead some of this, and sign up for this. Thanks. One of the things that I've done as a manager is if I see somebody doing things that I know will 
be negative towards them. So if they use language of I'm sorry or I, that's the one that always gets me is the I'm sorry or I'm bothering you or things like that, to literally tell them don't say that. Say it this way, you know, and this is why. So call out those small things because I think sometimes when people hear the word mentorship, they think, oh, I've got to take them to lunch and I've got to do this and I've got to do that. It's, it's the simple, you're walking back from the meeting to your desk and say, hey, I heard you say this and it you know, negated what you were saying because of this reason. Because That's people great. need to hear that like immediately and repeatedly. And it, it took me a long time to learn those things. Well, yeah, and that goes back to one of the real drivers, which is getting developmental feedback and hard messages. And people tend to not do that for women. And so telling the person, don't go sit on the side of the room, sit at the table when you walk in. Take the, the, the main seat at the table. Speak up in the meeting. I want to hear your voice. Don't use like and sorry and don't caveat what you're saying. Be assertive and forceful if, if you need to in that meeting. Like I think giving that coaching and that feedback is quite valuable. Now, of course, not, not, not necessarily trying to um, per only promote one kind of leadership style, right? You also want to recognize different leadership styles. And some people have more assertive leadership styles, and some people have more quiet leadership styles. And all that's fine. But definitely giving feedback where people are taking away from their own credibility or not st stepping up and, and owning leadership opportunities the way they can. I think that's really, really important. Hi, thank you for reinforcing much of what we try to do here at Google with lots of external data that's always necessary. Um, first, I'd like to say that was Matt, and he's actually one of my mentors, so he's sort of practicing what he preaches already, and I'm like the opposite of everything he just said. <laughs> so <laughs> kudos to him. Um, my question is, do you have data around or a POV on um, this idea that by focusing on women's empowerment, um, gender parity, elevating women in the workforce, that that is discriminatory against men? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Um, or that's, I, I mean, so, I mean, we're so far from being discriminatory against men right now that I think it's sort of, you know, it's, it's cleaning up some of the issues rather than trying to put in place quotas or, you know, things like that. And so I think, you know, if, if anything is perceived as discriminatory against men, or if there is something like an, a quota that can be perceived in that way, um, that can be damaging to the whole cause, right? Uh, but so all of the things and the data that we've shown here has been about things that are cleaning up the issues, not swinging the pendulum the other way around, I would say. I agree with you, just I'm always playing devil's advocate. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. No, I appreciate that. Hi. Hi. I had a question in regards to, to both gender diversity but also age diversity. So I was speaking with um, one of my Google mentors the other day, and we were talking about you know the job postings, even on the Google site. I don't know if you guys have seen, but obviously it, it shows X amount of years of experience. And he was saying he read a study that even though, so it says, four years of experience required, and some men, they'll look at that and they only have two, and they'll be like, I'm gonna go for it. Where girls are like, I have three, but I'll hold back until I have that four before I can go for that position. And so, um, I mean, that's sometimes I have an urge, and I'm like, you know what, I'm, I read the qualifications, I'm like, I could totally go for that. But I see the level of experience, and I'm like, obviously, I mean, being out of college and things like that, you don't have that. But I mean, with technology nowadays, it's those years of experience aren't really relevant to you know what's happening. So I wanted to get your opinion on those postings. It's a really good point, and there's two sides to that coin. So one is the way in which the job posting is being written, and should you write it? So well, no, actually, let me take a step back. It is very much proven over and over that women tend to re, like to, to hold a higher bar for themselves. A man and a woman will go into the exact same review. And the woman will come out and say, oh my god, I did, like, here are the 700 things I did terribly. And the man will be like, I rocked it. Um, literally the same language. Um, and similarly, exactly as you're saying, men will be like, ah, four years experience. I was in college for four years. <laughs> Um, you know, and a woman will be like, "Oh no, I well, I had four, I have six years of experience, but four of them, two of them weren't exactly right, and blah blah blah." Like it is, it is, it is just human nature, um, and and a lot of studies have shown that. So there's two things to do about that. One is to educate women on um, self advocacy, and like how do I, how do you start to think about yourself and and actually reach for reach higher, reach harder, and be okay with taking more risks and things like that. 
Um, and I think that is actually an important part of it. And we, for example, at McKinsey do a lot around that, which is like, how can you raise your hand and ask for more opportunities and be more, you know, if, if, if the, your male counterpart is going and asking all these other people for promotions, you should, you know, you, you can do the same. Um, and then secondly, I think there's also the, the part about the writing of the job posting. So if we know that women read it that way, maybe trying to shift the language a little bit so it doesn't say, you know, it, 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 it seems that the four years of experience is more of a nice to have, or you, you can write in such a way that it, 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 you're not playing to that, that, that bias. I think that's a really good point. Okay, one more. Hi. Um, you were talking a lot about, thank you for being here firstly, so this study is super interesting. Uh, you were talking a lot about self-advocacy, but early in the study we, we heard about how women who advocate a lot for themselves are perceived to be aggressive or bossy. How do you manage that, those two perceptions? So that's a really good question. Um, I think that the, it's about managing away the bossy issue. Like I, I think the answer is not to let women, not to tell women, okay, well then just operate within that bias, it's we have to change the bias. So you're right, I mean, I think there's, women get called, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, it's sort of like the damned if you do, damned if you don't, where where do we stand? But I think you just, I mean, self-advocacy, I think that the bar, the, the barrier between how women self-advocate, or the, sorry, the gap between how women self-advocate versus men is, is, is even bigger than the, bear, the um, gap between how women are perceived as bossy versus not. So I would just sort of, I, even though they are linked, I would separate the two and address them each equally because I think they're both very important. And it's better to be called bossy and still get the promotion, yeah. Yeah. you know, than to like not get it at all. Thank you so much, this was awesome. Um, and thanks to all of you. It was, it was really great, Charlotte, and you gave some fantastic advice. The other thing that struck me as I was listening was just the awesome advice that you gave each other. And so I hope that each of you takes away at least one nugget from this conversation, whether from Charlotte and McKinsey or from what some of your colleagues shared. And I passionately believe the way we address this over time is really the continuity of the conversation. So many of the things that we talked about, if we're able to sort of quickly and easily bat back and forth what we heard, what we saw, what the impact was, we will consistently get better. So please keep the conversation going, both in these settings, but also in the hallways, and, and continue to look to each other and, and to all of us for, for tips to move this forward. Uh, thank you guys so much. <laughs>